Um, I wanted to talk about the fact that out of the top 10 uh, films at the New Zealand box office, um, at least four of them have come from books. And uh, I hope this is working. Uh, I'll talk to him. Um, you know, Boy was an autobiography, and World's Fastest Indian was a true story. Once for Warriors is a book, Whale Ride is a book. Sione's wedding was based on a group, uh, a um, theatre group who were already in existence. What Becomes of the Broken Hearted is a book. Uh, Foot Rod Flats is a book cartoon. Uh, Second Hand Wedding Autobiography. Uh, Top Twins Untouchable Girls on a biopic. And Sione's Two Unfinished Business, um, a follow up to Sione. So every one of those had a story before it got to the screen. None of them were original stories just from leaping from somebody's mind with a group of characters who nobody had ever heard of before. And that's the big advantage of being with a book. Um, we are going to have to get the presentation right because each of the publishers has got you think, the material they want to show you. Here we go. Sorry about this. Um, one of the, some of the things that we'll cover today will include optioning, uh, the relationship that you will have with the, with the publisher as you develop, um, the fact, the way that you communicate with the publisher. Um, surprisingly, a number of people approach publishers about rights and then the publisher never hears from them again. Very bad form. You must probably only do that two or three times and you'll be on a list of lost your letter. So have a think about that too. Um, I'm not quite sure. Sorry about this. Um, I think that maybe we'll talk about filling the time. Talk about <laughs> about um, optioning. Um, I, I'm assuming that most people are aware of the fact that when you hear about a book or you read about it. Um, and you think that that might make a story that you want to make into a film or a television series uh, or a one-off documentary, that you know that you can option the property before you actually buy it, and that you want to option it with the right to buy it and the right to um, adapt it. So I'm going to ask um, the panel uh, of their experience uh, what, what sort of things that you look for um, when you're approached by producers. Well, I mean, I, my, I feel if you're going to option a book, you've got to um, agree the whole, the whole final agreement if it happens. Because if if a filmmaker is um, putting all that time and money into optioning it and developing it, then they're going to want to go ahead, and you want to, to go ahead. So you actually have to do a whole, you know, ha you've got to work out how serious they are, how how um, realistic it is, and you've actually got to work out a deal that will go ahead right off that offset. So, so it's not just, oh, yeah, give it a go and then we'll see further down the track. It's actually right, let's, let's sort it out and get it sorted right up front um, because it is a serious, you know, it's a serious relationship. It's not just a, an experiment, really, at that stage. And, Deborah, do you find that you um, do some work on the track record of the person that's approaching? Oh, I think it, it certainly gives you a degree of confidence if you know it's someone who's had experience making films, um, getting funding, getting something off the ground. Because I guess from a publisher and author's point of view, there's, it's opportunity cost, isn't it? If someone's yep. optioned a film, um, well, you've got, you know, your money's in their bank, if you like. Um, so, yeah, we would, we would generally... Um, Ex, you know, expect to know a little bit about them. We'd always ask, if it wasn't someone we knew, we'd ask, you know, what's their experience? Have they done this before? Who are they planning possibly to work with? Where do they think their fun funding's going to come from? That sort of thing. What's going to be the budget? Po you know, proposal budget. Um, so that you've got a good basis on which to, I guess, advise the author. Right. And Fergus, um, do you get concerned? I, I don't mean to the... Uh, do you... Do you take the time to inquire what they're going to do with the book, how they're going to treat it? 
Absolutely. I mean, that's critical with options. Um, the first thing I would do, um, if, in the, if in the first place we actually control the option, because sometimes with New Zealand books, the option's controlled by an agent or by an international publisher. So the first thing is to know whether we can represent the author or whether we have to refer the inquiry. Um, if it's something that we're involved in, then the first thing to do is to talk to the filmmaker and put them together with the author and get them to make a pitch. And we really look for um, evidence of creative thinking and a personal commitment to the project because um, we know that the author is going to have to agree to someone else reimagining their work, and that's a big thing personally to ask of an author who's made this thing out of their heart. Um, and we're going to want that confidence before we proceed further into sort of the detail of money and the style of adaptation and the time frame for the option and things like that. And Robin, um, did you, you've had some projects where people, which you've optioned and you've waited a period of time and they haven't come to fruition? Yes, in fact, I'd, I'd say no. that's more <laughs> rules, <laughs> actually. Um, uh, when we option a project, we do give it a certain amount of time. It's usually two years or something like that. And um, But some people we don't hear from again. Some do contact again and want a lot more time. Um, it, it varies hugely. I think what um, has struck me about this whole um, business is that, that each project is just so different. It depends on the author, depends on the um, production company and what they... They are looking for and what they have done before and what they can do and you know there's a huge range of uh, possibilities so we really look at you know project by project. Okay, um, just quickly go back because I'm going to take some questions in a minute. Just um, for your information, at South Pacific Pictures, uh, those are some of the projects that we've um, optioned and turned into work, and uh, some that are in development, including uh, two at the top, one at the bottom. Uh, but, you know, for us, it's a very key part of what we do uh, outside series television is look for material that, will, that, that, that is established and that will resonate with an audience. And so when you talk about um, a project like, uh, you know, What Becomes of the Broken Hearted or, or um, Whale Rider, there is an audience who already know what, what the story is. You don't have to tell them all over again. And also, you know, that's just a few other films that I was involved in before, before then. Um, I wanted to, maybe, um, Harriet, would you like to... Yep. Does, so is here. that going to work from, from here now? And just talk about some of the projects that you've got. Um, okay, I'm going to just run through this year's, um, the titles that we've, we've got rights on, um, and this we published at the beginning of the year. It's a rich and darkly funny novel about family history and the risk and power of knowledge. The main character's mother had an obsession, her ancestry, but what she uncovered was a colourful assortment of characters and their fondness for cruelty. The novel moves from a tiny one-house island in the present, which is surrounded by mangroves, to various... Uh, wonderfully various and varied pasts, and there's a highway uh, robber um, who's in a, in, imprisoned on, on, a sh on a ship. Um, four generations of the black family have farmed Black Peak Station, which is, but tradition stands in the way of Charlotte taking over because she's a girl. Being stubborn as a rock, she's not going to give up on her dream. To achieve it, there can be no re room for romance in Charlotte's life, or so she thinks. <coughs> can she have both land and love? So it's... An unapologetically popular romance. Mm -hmm. Fall of Light by Sarah Lang, um, is, uh, we've just released it. Um, Rudy is a successful but artistically frustrated architect. When an accident forces him to recuperate, he looks in danger of losing everything, both family and career. But it is th at this point that his repressed artistic yearnings start to make their presence felt, not just in the glass creations he begins to craft, but also in his strange, vivid dreams. 
This is a terrific novel in its own right, but with Sarah Lang's superb ink wash drawings interspersing the text, it offers an additional intriguingly innovative way to tell a story, and that could be easily transposed into film, and this is the sort of images that intersperse the actual text, which could be an interesting different way to, to present your films. Do you see, do you, do you have views about whether you want them to be film, TV series, TV one-off, reality? How, how do you, does that worry you? Or are you waiting for the filmmaker to ask that question or suggest that question? Um, I don't think, we wouldn't dictate what has to be done. I mean, obviously we want, we would want, ideally, we're all on the same side. We want the best thing for our authors. We would love a huge, successful, blockbustering, worldwide film that would put them on the map. That would be our ideal. But okay. we're also realists, so we understand. Right. So you know, it, it's 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 a partnership, and we you know it's sort of it's what 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 can be made. Okay. I mean, if we look at um, uh, the Sarah Lang um, piece, you know, would, would it be? Uh, feasible for it to be um, a graphic a graphic film? I think, anime. So. I, mean, yeah. I think that's quite potentially exciting. I think that there's a, you know, you, you could join up with the Japanese and make them fabulous stuff. Right, okay. <laughs> and um, Infinite Air is a novel. It is, I know this is the, 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 this is the one that may be slightly difficult to sell rights on in that it is based on real life, but then she has brought it together and, and, and um, given it, given it a, um, a dramatic shape and a, and a story. To okay, it. I think the lawyers in the room they, would I say that she. Well, no, she's dead, and, <laughs> and yeah. therefore. It's much easier. Much <laughs> easier, yeah. Um, and, but there is another work on. There's a There's a sorry. Uh, she she wrote um, an autobiography, and there is a biography. Um, and then this is a novel based on her life. Which is interesting because if you were thinking of doing one, you most probably should get the rights on all three because you don't actually... The sooner or later, yeah, there's, that, going, that to be, be there's going to be yeah. facts that are in all of them and you don't want somebody coming after you saying, you took the facts from my book. When, and there might be some facts in one book that aren't in another. And you know that might be yeah. your lead but it wouldn't be a bad idea to have the others covered. Yeah, yeah those facts aren't copyrighted. No, but just... But it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's the shape you give them. Yeah, OK. Um, all right. Um, and I know we'll come back to, because I'm going to talk to you about, about how tie-ins work. But before we do that, uh, Deborah, would you like yeah. to... Hang on, I'll just see if we can... I think you need to load oh, it, don't you? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, just to pause. All right. Meantime, you can tell me which one to push. Yeah. OK. Um, just before they come up, what I've done is just um, s taken a selection of novels which I guess, in my mind, um, could translate comfortably and perhaps without too much um, difficulty to film. So um, it's always, you know, we've got a huge backlist of titles. We um, publish new fiction titles every year. Um, and sometimes you can be surprised by the, you know, what someone does show interest in. So something we publish that you wouldn't necessarily think um, would be an obvious um, film. So forgive me if I've gone totally in the wrong tangent, but um, these ones just seem to me to have some sort of uh, relevance for today's session anyway. Um, so first up... Um, Lives We Leave Behind, which is written by Maxine Alterio. She's a um, Dunedin author. It's her second only novel, but we have actually sold um, the French rights for it, and it's actually been published in France this year. So I thought that's probably another factor of, or interest factor for you, knowing that it's had appeal outside of just New Zealand. Um, and the context for this is the First World War, which of course is very topical at the moment with um, the First World War commemorations um, in 2014. Um, essentially, this is a story of two main characters, two young women who travel to the front lines in France as nurses um, from small towns in New Zealand. One of them um, is, is much more demure than the other, um, so there's very quiet, cautious Addie and, a, and her um, soon to become friend um, Meg who's very impetuous and fun loving. There's a romantic thread through it. Meg falls head over heels in love with a surgeon when they get to their um, posting in France. Um, there's something a little bit um, 
uneasy about um, uh, this dashing surgeon that she falls head over heels for. Um, Addie is a little bit more circumspect, she has her suspicions, so there's a bit of a romantic twist there. Um, I think what's unique about this, um, Maxine is an exemplary researcher, um, and she has, I think, um, through this novel, given um, voice to the experiences of the New Zealand nurses who did travel um, to the front line. So it's a different perspective of war from a woman, uh, women's perspective, and also very meticulous researching of medical procedures, medicines, that sort of thing used. So essentially the setting is field hospitals on the front lines um, with a somewhat, um, on, on route, a somewhat um, dramatic um, journey by ship. So based on some real events and um, fictionalised um, account of war as well. This next book is by um, Paula Morris, um, one of our brightest uh, young writers. She's currently based um, in um, Sheffield in the UK. Uh, so Rangatira won the New Zealand Post Fiction Award in 2012. Um, we've sold German rights for this um, novel, so it was published in Germany last year. Um, and this is based on true stories. So um, n it's narrated by, in fact, um, Paula's great-grandfather, um, Paratani, uh, Paratani Tamanu. He was um, part of a group of uh, Northland chiefs who travelled to the United Kingdom um, in the 1860s to meet with Queen Victoria. Um, so it's an account of um, that party of chiefs uh, travelling, um, very long, obviously, sea voyage, um, them being paraded, I guess, um, as... Uh, well, curiosities um, as much as anything, um, but also how that that party then eventually sort of broke down and um, so eventually sort of disintegrated into, you know, um, humiliation. A couple of them went off and actually joined the circus. Um, some of them were left in poverty to fend for themselves. Um, so based on true events, fictionalised account, um, quite, quite powerful and poignant and a re relatively small cast of characters too, so. Uh, the next novel, um, this was also a New Zealand Post fiction um, winner in 2011, uh, 11, um, published by Penguin in 2010 and written by Lawrence Fernley, The Hut Builder. Um, set in small town New Zealand, so Ranfurly, um, and it sort of spans a period of about 20 years, uh, close to 20 years. Um, the central character is, I guess, a very typical um, repressed, starts out as slightly repressed New Zealand male in, in this time. So he is a young boy when the novel starts. Um, his twin brothers have both been killed in the war and his mother in particular is severely damaged by this um, and really can't can't really mother him anymore. Um, so he's almost adopted by a family um, in, the, in um, the town. His father runs um, the, the local butcher's shop um, and Bowden is sort of destined to take over the, you know, the meat cleaver, really. Um, but through his uh, friendship with this other family, um, he starts, something in him starts to stir and awaken he becomes very aware of the natural surroundings around him, the Mackenzie base and the beauty of that, and also he develops, starts to develop a love of poetry. So it's kind of a complex story of a, um, of a typical New Zealand man who has a softer side. Um, and much of the novel is actually set on Mount Cook. He's up there building a hut, and um, he actually summits Mount Cook with Sir Edmund Hillary. So again, interweaving of um, true, true facts into a novel. Another war story for you. This one's set in the Second World War. Um, this was published a few years ago in a first novel by Nicholas Edlin, who was living in the UK at the time, but um, is now back in, in Auckland, um, working as a lawyer, um, writing in, you know, like lots of writers, not full time. Um, this is set in Auckland in the, 19, in the Second World War. Um, Victoria Park was actually a, a military camp, um, military hospital, um, so it's set in that area, that Ponsonby area, um, 
the central character is a surgeon um, with the US Marines. It starts out with him sort of narrating, so it's a passage of time, narrating the story from an older um, man's perspective, re recalling his time here. Um, and he, he falls in love with uh, a local woman, but there's something strange about her family. Unknown to him, they're, um, they're actually German sympathisers. Um, and the woman's brother is in fact um, an informant for the, for the Germans. Um, so it has this wonderful tension that runs throughout it. Um, Nicholas, I think, the, his great skill as a writer is just to kind of, kind of keep the, this air of mystery and tension um, running through a storyline. And finally, not yet published, so the other publishers in, in the room, please cover your eyes. Um, this, is a, this is a novel we'll be publishing um, in early 2014, but I'm just really aware of the timeframes for making films, um, and I mean, many of our options run to their third extension, and then they're still in negotiation for an additional extension, so I thought, what the hell, let's talk about something before it's even out there. Uh, we do have a, a manuscript that's edited and, and could, could we read. Um, Written by Charlotte Randall, she's a Christchurch um, writer. This is, I think, probably her seventh or eighth novel. Um, and again, I think what's had, the, we've got this strong trend. I don't know whether it's a trend and others are seeing it, but um, stories based on true facts. So this is a true story of four convicts who escaped on a sealing ship from um, Norfolk Island in the 19th century. Um, but there wasn't enough, they were discovered on the ship, there wasn't enough food for them to stay on the ship, so they were put off at Snares on, in the Snares Islands, which is um, 200 kilometres south of the South Island. Um, and basically the captain of the ship they'd been on said, right, well, I'll leave you here. You can pay your passage um, from here by um, culling some seals, and I'll call back and pick you up in a year's time. Well, it was eight years later that eventually um, three of the four were rescued. So it's really, a, it's a bit of a Robinson Crusoe story of survival. Um, so a cast of four characters in very inhospitable um, circumstances. Unfortunately, you, can't, you can no longer go to Snares Island, I believe, so that, that would count that as a setting for the film. Um, but um, an incredible piece of storytelling, um, a very strong narrative, and a real twist at the end when, um, in fact, the, the the novel is narrated by um, the convict who ends up actually being being murdered by his fellow um, refugees okay. on this island. So, yeah, as I said, a classic tale of survival with a twist. Just going back to um, <coughs> Rangatira, that was serialised on radio, wasn't it? Yes, it was. was. Yeah, yeah, well, it was, yes, yeah. yeah. And um, I remember thinking, I, I mean, I was really intrigued by the story. Do you think that that could be... Um, a documentary, a significant documentary? Yes, it could be. Yes, it could be. I guess it could be a dramatised documentary yeah. as well. But yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it it, it's very, it, very colourful in the world in which that they, they, when they moved to London and the way that they're fated in London and, and, um, and the relationships that they create. Yes. It, you know, there's a, there's, there's a lot of interest in all that. Yeah. Okay. Um, and in the case of um, the uh, the last book, which mm -hmm. is not yet published, um, I think it's it's you know you're all very lucky to see a book that hasn't been published because, as Deborah say, says, it does take a long time to put these projects together, and it's good to know that there's something coming out, um, and to give you time to think about that. So um, okay, we'll we'll come back to and visit some of these. Um, can we load? Victoria University Press, please, and Fugus. Well, kia ora tato. Thanks for having me here, and thanks, John, for the introduction. Um, I was really pleased on your opening screen to see two VUP titles. Um, <laughs> one was um, The End of the Golden Weather, um, the Bruce Mason play, um, which was, of course, handled by the Mason Estates theatrical agents, and the other was the wonderful little Hugh Price book, yeah. um, The Plot to Subvert Wartime New Zealand, which made a great little telly movie three or four years ago. Um, so while I've been thinking that in my nearly 30 years of um, experience in publishing, not many expressions of interest have made it to formal options, and not many of those options have actually made it to screen. There have been a few, and most of them have been from our non-fiction list or from the play scripts list. 
but today I want to talk to you about um, some of the novels because I think there's a great untapped resource there in New Zealand fiction. Um, th this is me um, basking in the reflected glory of Ellie Catton at her launch for the Luminaries at Time Out just 10 days ago. Um, and I'll move straight on. I'm going to go through a baker's dozen titles starting way back in 1987. Within 15 minutes you can say a lot, the collected fiction of Greville Texador. Now, Greville Texador, in her youth, was a member of the Bloomsbury set in England. That's when that lovely portrait by Mark Gertl was painted. Um, she worked as a music hall dancer and contortionist and met a Spaniard called Texador, married him, went off to the Spanish Civil War where she fought in the anarchist militia. And I mean she fought, she carried a gun, she was in action. Um, she divorced Mr Texador and married a German communist called Werner Droscher and came to New Zealand as a refugee. Um, she was a friend of Frank Sargison. She began writing. She knew Karl Wolfscale and the other refugee writers. Um, wrote some fantastic fiction about the North Shore literary set. Then after the war, she divorced Drosha and went to Sydney to reunite with the Spanish anarchists who were largely um, in exile there and ended up um, lonely and reflective in the Blue Mountains. Um, a wonderful story that's just made for film, and the book gives you um, not all of those episodes, but certainly a great deal of wonderful language and imagery to work from. Um, one of my favourite New Zealand writers of the last 25 years, Barbara Anderson, um, it's incredible to me that none of her wonderful books have ever made it to the screen. Um, I can see Fiona in the back there. Um, Girls High very nearly made it to the small screen, and it would have been wonderful if that had come about. Um, Portrait of the Artist's Wife, um, which is her major novel um, in which um, a couple are traced through 40 years of life. Um, and at first it looks like he's the big artist and she's the wife and supporter. And of course, history in New Zealand reversed itself and she was revealed to be the major figure. A terrific novel. That was optioned. Um, it never came about. I'm not sure why. Um, Jeff Cochran. Um, Jeff Cochran is the ultimate cult New Zealand writer. Um, he's got an incredibly avid follower who have weekly Twitter meetings where they quote their favourite lines back and forth. Um, these two novels, his only novels, um, both set in the 1970s in the sort of New Zealand underworld of drinkers and dreamers and petty crooks, both centred on a sort of sensitive young poet who goes wrong and undergoes several adventures. Um, Jeff's a cult writer whose moment is about to come, I believe. Um, Dan Kirch is in the audience here. He's got a short film based on a short story that's either in production or close to that at the moment. Um, there's also talk about a biographical um, documentary on Jeff um, that might come through in the next little while. Um, and we're preparing Jeff's collected stories and a bit more work. So Jeff Cochran's there waiting to be done. Tim Nimbus was optioned several times, or there was an option which was renewed year after year. Again, never quite made it. Um, the late Nigel Cox, again a, a great New Zealand writer. The Cowboy Dog is perhaps the obvious one, the novel in which a young cowboy from the Central Plateau sees his father gunned down by a villain, um, pitches a train to Auckland, serves burgers in a burger bar, um, waits till he's big enough, hitches back to the Central Plateau, and digs up his father's guns, which he's buried, and takes a terrible revenge on the villain and the posse. Um, again, it's been optioned. Things have happened. Things haven't quite got there. Skylark Lounge, though, is the, my personal favourite of Nigel's novel. This is about a man who runs a pool hall. He's down on his luck. He's separated. He's had a cancer diagnosis. And then he starts hearing aliens talk to him through the dusty, through the, um, the songs that he's playing in the pool hall. That sends him out on a road trip, which takes him on a bit of a loop and reunites him with his life. Um, a lovely story, and actually both of these novels are quite short novels, and they're probably the perfect size and the perfect density of detail to translate into a lovely film. Now we're going to get into um, this year's list. Um, this is Daniel McLaughlin's Unspeakable Secrets of the Arrow Valley, which has been in the New Zealand fiction bestseller list for the five weeks now since it was published. 
Um, I'll read from my notes here. It's described on the back as a classic Kiwi comic, mystery, erotic, horror adventure novel. <laughs> it's about a hapless young man who gets involved in a charismatic cult cult in the Aro Valley, a cult leader called The Campbell Walker, always referred to in the book as The Campbell Walker, and many people here will know The Campbell Walker, um, and Campbell happily came up to Wellington especially for the launch and appeared there, though he wouldn't speak. Um, it's a wonderful um, adventure novel in which they're seeking a kind of a secret of existence in a Dan Brown fashion. And Daniel's um, starting point for this book was why shouldn't the secret to existence, why shouldn't the great lost um, treasure of the Golden Dawn movement be hidden somewhere in a crumbling house in an inner city location in New Zealand? <coughs> so he's said it here. Um, it's a terrific read. Um, a few people have requested copies of this. Um, we're waiting to hear. We hope we will hear something. The luminaries. Um, now, we, we, since that got on the book along list and was reviewed wonderfully, we received several requests for reading copies from New Zealand production houses. In this case, um, the rights are controlled by LE's London agent. So what we do in that situation is we give the contact deals of the agent to the person who requests the copy, and we send the copy. Um, you know, my view of these things is that because so few expressions of interest ever turn into firm options, you keep talking to everybody who's prepared to talk to you until something's been signed. Um, but what I can say is that uh, a London producer called Andrew Woodhead, who has spooks and other things on his CV, has optioned this for a 13-part TV series. Um, and that all sounds extremely exciting. Um, and will obviously have to be filmed in New Zealand because of all of those wonderful Hokitika locations. So. Uh, Max Gate, new novel by Damien Wilkins. Um, this is coming out in September this year. Um, this is a departure for Damien. It's a historical novel about the last day in the life of Thomas Hardy and the following few days. It's narrated by his servant, Nellie Titterington, a historical figure. And really it's about the contest about the remains and the legacy of a great writer. Um, so there is a plot, and this is a true plot, um, where there was a big argument between um, Hardy's literary acolytes like J.M. Barry and others and family and friends in Dorset about whether he would be buried in the local churchyard or taken to Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey. Um, they solved it by cutting out his heart and taking it in a biscuit tin to Westminster Abbey, but burying the rest of him in Dorset. Um, so that, if you like, is the kind of the structure of the plot. But what the book really is, is just a lot of wonderful, um, vivid interaction between the various characters who are moving in a sort of hushed fashion around the deathbed scene, and then in the days afterwards, trying to manage things. I'm working on a building, um, a novel by Pip Adam, and look, there's a typo there. My proofreading's shocking. There's no S on Adam. Um, this book is coming out in October, um, and this will be a huge challenge for someone to adapt. It's the life story of an engineer called Catherine. It begins in the near future when uh, an exact replica of the Burj Al Khalifa, the biggest building in the world, is being constructed in New Zealand um, as a sort of a post-earthquake confidence building exercise by the government. Um, the novel then goes backwards in time through a series of episodes tracing Catherine's life. Um, she's in the Occupy movement in London. She's in North Korea on a big hotel project. She's involved in the earthquake and only narrowly escapes with her life. Um, she, as a student, she has some um, terribly wayward years um, because her family lost all of its money in the Great Collapse in 1987. And even before that, you go back to a moment, a spooky moment, when as a little girl she goes missing in the Pompidou Centre in Paris. Um, what Pip has tried to do with this book is that she studied engineering as well as literature while she was writing it. And she's written a book in which in each section, the building 
is as much of a character as the character. And the language comes from engineering as much as it does from the humanities. I mean, an absolutely amazing book which turns New Zealand literature on its head. Um, Wake by Elizabeth Knox. Um, this is a, not, not a complete departure from Elizabeth. Um, what this is is a book which takes that classic science fiction horror trope of a terrible disaster which kills almost everyone leaving a small band of survivors who are locked into the small idyllic town where it happened and must find out what happened and solve the puzzle in order to save themselves over the weeks that ensue. Um, what I can tell you by way of making it sound a bit better is that the Kākāpō and the Reserve all survive unharmed. <laughs> That's coming in November. And just going on like Deborah, I've got one for next year. Um, this is the first novel by Kerry Donovan Brown called Lamplighter. Kerry won the prize in the MA in Creative Writing at the International Institute of Modern Letters last year, and he's just turned in the revised draft of that book. It's a wonderful short novel which is just on that cusp between young adult and adult literature. Um, it's set in a New Zealand slightly alternative reality. It's a small coastal town in which certain kinds of folklore have survived and magic seems to be real. So that's the rhyme there, the night, the flood, as black as foul. That's one of the little incantations that the people use to ward off the evil spirits. Um, every evening, a man goes around and lights oil lamps through, around the perimeter of the town to keep them safe by light from the encroaching dark. That man is the grandfather of the central character. He's the lamplighter. The central character is Candle. Um, he's the apprentice. But over the week in which the action takes place, he learns about the true history of his family, um, the true origins of this little myth. And I suppose, in a way, what happens is that the folklore crumbles, but Candle, the adolescent, is released into the world with his own birthright. And that's my Baker's Dozen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some of those which go back, you know, uh, Greville Texador and, and Jeff Cochran, uh, and also Barbara Anderson's work, as you say, have been in your catalogue for quite a few years. Um, and yes, uh, Barbara's been optioned um, a couple of times, but have you had, um, have you initiated discussions with with um, filmmakers previously? Have you attempted to <clears throat> get these stories into a different um, medium? I, I think I have to confess here that we haven't been nearly as proactive as we probably should be as publishers. And partly this might be something that's developed through um, lack of success over the years. And um, so what we concentrate on is what we can do and we, we, what we know we can do successfully in terms of selling these books to a New Zealand readership yeah. and also selling international publishing <coughs> rights. So most of these writers have had international deals for their books. So we focus on that. With screen adaptation, we've tended, I think, to be quite passive. Yeah. So we wait for inquiries. And in fact, the inquiries we get relate very much to the media coverage and the sales record and the prizes the books generate. And actually, one thing I've sort of worked out from watching people's faces when I've tried to pitch things at them is that there's not much to be gained from pitching something that you believe in passionately until there's some other acclamation from the world which will tell that person that actually other people are going to see it the same way. Um, that's, that's interesting because <clears throat> in, in a lot of cases where producers, directors and writers are creating their own stories, um, they have, they find it quite difficult also to pitch into a market, and the validity of a published work is is um, really puts you one step up. And um, I was thinking also about the timing of of things, so that <clears throat> the luminaries, which has been published this week, when did you, how long has Eleanor been working on that? Oh. She's been writing the book for three years, pretty yeah. much full time, and I've been reading it in instalments for about two years of that. The book wasn't, in fact, completed until February this year, right. or January this year, um, and then some significant revisions in February. 
Um, so in fact, by international publishing standards, it's been quite a quick turnaround for a book of 270,000 words yeah. to get it from manuscript to print. 800 pages, for those mm. of you who... Well, it, it, it's as big as three other books, but it's better than three other books. <laughs> um, because that raises also an issue that, that in um, some territories where possibly where things are a lot more active, the, the discussions about adaptations are taking place quite a bit before publishing. I'm, I'm aware of that, um, yeah. and I think that particularly happens where you have agents with media departments, and I've you know worked with writers who have been represented by AP Watt or yeah. Peter Fraser and Dunlop or United Agents, yeah. and they're much more active, and they're sort of working with the international publishers to try and seek that interest earlier. But even in those cases, and even with quite high-profile writers, it often doesn't seem to take up any momentum until something's happened to the book to prove that it's connecting with audiences. Novels although the more that somebody's reputation's enhanced, uh, the, the greater the, the chance of it being picked up. But, but if you look at um, uh, some of the stories, I think some, some things that you had, Deborah and, and Harriet, where they're based on a real, a real event, um, I <clears throat> would think that quite a few producers would be able to look at something and think there's a story there. And that will make a good telling, aided by the fact that a book is coming out. And sometimes, you know, I know that we wish that we'd been able to look at something earlier, as much to say no, as rather not just to tie it up. It's not a matter of tying these things up, because there's, you know, there's not a, not a lot of point in optioning 20 or 30 properties, because you're just not going to make them. And it's not fair to the, the publisher and to the author for, you, for that book to be tied up if you're not going to make it. You have to make some real decisions. You know, the, on average, these books can take four, five years or more to get to the screen. I mean, Wild Rider actually took 17. But, um, you know, it's, you can't tie up somebody's work if you're not actually going to do anything with it. And I think that, that that's something for producers to remember that you've got to play, you know, fair on your side as well. Uh, Robin, can you tell us what you've got coming up? Could you tell us about Julia Press as well? Yes, yeah, I'll, t I'll talk about Julia while she's um, bringing it up. Uh, Julia Publishers was set up in 1991, so we're over 20 years old, and we're an independent publishing company, and we focus on uh, producing books and publications that um, have bring a Māori perspective. We um, develop and promote Māori writers and we also publish works in Māori language. And so that is our kind of focus. And so what I'm going to talk about today is just, just um, unlike the others, I've actually just gone by genre really, to give you a, just to give you a sort of flavour of the types of things that we cover um, and that we publish. Um, we have had uh, you know, a number of books optioned by different film companies, and I think only one or two have probably made it to film. Um, uh, but anyway, I'll just give you a, a sort of a, a, um, an idea of the sorts of things that we have. Um, the first things I've picked out are, are just some novels that, that I thought were suitable for film. They've got um, uh, interesting plots and exciting and interesting and in-depth, really, characters. Uh, the first one on the left is The Scent of Apples by Jackie McRae. It's a, it's a, um, a young adult novel. It's for um, 12 to 16-year-olds, roundabout. Uh, and it talks about Libby. That's Libby there. And um, uh, her, her issues that she has after the death of her grandfather, which, and she gets sent to boarding school. And... Um, and it talks about the, the re relationship she forms, really, with friends and families of friends while at boarding school. Um, but it's a, it's a, um, it's a, it's a nice uh, story about a young, young woman and the kinds of dilemmas I think that teenagers of that age are likely to be thinking about. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a nice story. 
The set ATL talk next about Bugs, the one on this side. Uh, Bugs is by Fiti Heriaka. That's her, this is her second novel. Uh, Fiti you might have heard of. She is a, a, a playwright as well. And she has won a number of um, awards for writing. She's had a, a residence at the Randall Cottage in Wellington. She had a residency at the Michael, uh, Michael King Centre in Auckland. And she's actually recently just um, got a place on the Iowa Writing uh, uh, School in the States. Uh, so she's just gone there. But Bugs is again a, um, a young adult's novel, and it is. And I think what's interesting about that and what, why I thought it might be use, interesting for a film is she's really picked up on young people's dialogue and the, um, the, just their way of being, I suppose, uh, today. And I thought that you know that there is probably space for a film of that type and of that kind of, with that language and those characters. Um, the middle book, Zoom Out, is by Mark Sweet, and this is a, um, a novel about an architect who goes to China, he is a New Zealander, but goes to live in China, and, he, and his experiences in China, uh, and, then, um, and then his you know, eventual return to New Zealand. Uh, so they're, they're sort of, yeah, just an interesting mix of um, novels. I've selected some uh, short stories. We, we do publish an, a, quite a large number of short story collections. Uh, the one on the, left, on the far side is by Alice Tarfai. Um, we have published three collections of short stories by Alice Tarfai. They are really well regarded, um, have won a number of awards, and several of her stories have actually been optioned for film, and some of them are under option at the moment. Um, the next one is by Tina Makariti, Once Upon a Time in Aotearoa, and those are just uh, unusual stories, I think, that would make good short films uh, about, uh, well, I suppose a modern take on Māori legends, in a way, um, and how those might, um, you know, conveyed in a different, different, completely different way. And the, the um, volume on this side, we produce, we um, run, I should say, a competition called the Pikihuia Awards for Māori writers every two years. And so from that we get a large number of Māori writers coming forward and, and, um, and, and therefore a, a um, big collection of short stories. And some of those have been of interest to uh, production companies over the years as well. This year we're running the... Um, competition again and so we will be publishing the 10th volume this year. Uh, we also produce a lot of non-fiction and I've just uh, given a couple of examples. Uh, Hikoi is about 40 years of Māori protest and really tracks the um, 40 years up to, up to, the two, up to 2000 of Māori protests on all sorts of uh, issues and the results of those protests. I've just uh, given the example of Ngāti Ruanui. We have done a number of uh, tribal histories, iwi histories and Māori histories. And so anybody interested in uh, creating either documentaries or drama uh, out of historical fiction, we do have, uh, out of history, we do have a lot of those, which of course could be dramatised as well. Uh, we produce a large number of Māori, ta uh, Māori language titles, and I don't know whether anyone is interested in uh, Māori language titles. The one on the far side has just won the um, New Zealand Post Book Awards uh, for, the, for the Māori language category this year, Ngā Waituhi Oriwa by Katerina Mataira. It is a science fiction work, uh, completely in Māori, a full-length novel. Um, it would be one of the few... Uh, in Māori and, and, it's, and it's a great story actually it's about a group of young people uh, who leave New Zealand when there is a um, I don't know, holocaust I guess in New Zealand or a catastrophe I should say environmental catastrophe in New Zealand and they um, go to live in outer space and create a community in outer space uh, on a place, in a place called Rehua 
uh, and at some stage in the future they return to Earth. Did you want to talk about some of the things that you've option, had optioned, or did you? Oh, I wasn't sure whether. Um, yeah, good Yeah. Okay. Some of the, I, I thought I'd just talk about um, some of our experiences with optioning and 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 thinking about going to film and, and all. It seems to me there's a long continuum from you start with a book and then all sorts of things can happen and occasionally they become a film and it seems to be a pretty um, fraught process and, and it's so varied. Um, one of the thing, issues for us, I suppose, is that we're publishing a lot of Māori writers and because of the um, success of Whale Rider and Once We're Warriors and, you know, all those films, and Now White Lies, our films by by Māori writers and about Māori situations is that um, many of our writers or, or some of our writers um, therefore think that if that um, A, they've got a greater chance of getting a film made and secondly the, the, these things are probably worth a million so you know that we could be trying to rip them off. So um, anyway, so I thought I'd just give you a, a, an idea of the range of such scenarios that we have. This is certainly not all of them but it just gives you a bit of an idea. Um, this was a, uh, a short story collection by Phil Cowan that we published quite a few years ago, about 95 or so. And, um, and there was a story in there called Redemption, uh, for which we uh, received an option. Uh, when we went back to the author, however, he decided that he didn't want to work with us. <laughs> he uh, wanted to work directly with the film company. And, and so we just agreed with that in the end. And, um, and the film was, that film was made. Uh, the next example I had was a, was a novel called Transit of Venus by Rowan Metcalf. It was, um, this is about a, the mutiny of the bounty really, told from the perspective of a Tahitian woman who was involved at that time. Uh, it's a lovely story. Um, and, 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 you know, was, I uh, can't remember the year it came out, but it was well regarded at the time it came out. Um, so we got an option from a film company in Canada uh, fairly soon after it was published. Uh, and they, and they um, had a scenario and a price that we thought was fairly reasonable. How we went back to the family, uh, just as we were about to publish the book, the author of this book died. Um, and so we were dealing with the fa her family uh, in the publishing of the book and then any future rights. And um, anyway, so we went back to the family with the offer that we had and, and um, they had a family member who uh, they said knew about film, so anyway they consulted with him and he came back and said, no, it's not, it's not enough money. And so we said, OK, so we went back to the film company. And so they then withdrew. And we, after that, had a um, second offer also for that book. Um, but in the end, neither of those proceeded. So it's still available. <laughs> uh, oh, as I said before, this is um, Festival of Miracles, uh, Alice Tarfai's um, first collection. Uh, at the moment, uh, several of her titles have been optioned, and actually, at the moment, we do have an option on a number of stories in this collection. So we're waiting to hear about those. Uh, and then show bands, um, which is the story of the Māori Volcanics show band. Uh, we sold the rights to that in 2007, and that is being made into a film, uh, but. We're still waiting for the film. <laughs> it's still coming, so I don't know. You know, when you said, hey, how long did you say that film not to make? Uh, yeah, but anyway. Uh, so, you know, it just gives you an idea of the range. Uh, recently, actually, we have been working also with, um, I think, two different um, film companies. Uh, one of them is the film, the book is being written and the film has been made in, at a similar time, and so they're developing together. Uh, so, I mean, that's another way that, mm. you know, these things can work. Mm. Thank you. Um, I, I, there's a few things I want to go, but why don't we take some questions? Have people got any questions? Um, there's actually a question for you, John, with your experience of, um, but the panel might have something to feed 
into it. Um, uh, Robert, when you were going through your list of films, you took like the scent of apples about that being for, I don't know, whatever it was, 12 to 16 year olds, whatever. My question in the transition from print to film is audience. Like there's teen literature and young adults, but does that audience exist in film? Um, there's a difference in how do you... That's a good question. Um, that is a good question. I think that's a decision as a, as a producer. You know, you really, if, if it's for television, then you're going to work with a network on, on something like that. If you're thinking of making it as a film, that is a tougher audience to reach because so much um, international material is being made for them, which is of a high CG and, you know, lots and lots of action. Um, and, and so that is, it is a tough market. To get into. Um, <clears throat> in, in a lot of countries there is uh, more money available for uh, the encouragement of adaptation of local material and I think it was interesting to hear about some of the titles that have been published in other countries because if you, if you think about um, the, the, something that's been published in England or France or Germany then there may be some opportunity for you to option it here and then go looking for a partner in another territory because the fact that it's been published there means that you might get some reaction and interest from a, a, a producer in that country who can use the fact that the, the book's been published there and then, and then here. And you've actually got a co-production immediately, in a sense, that you can generate... Um, financial uh, film production uh, finance for from two sources. So, you know, that's that's worth, worth thinking about. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, am I right in saying that we're widely seen as it derived from Witty's novella and then was made into a film and has now been rewritten for the film tie-in cover book thingy? <laughs> Great um, opportunity here. <laughs> it started as a novella published by Penguin, um, and what and Dano adapted it into a screenplay, which the final screenplay we've, we've put into the book. At the same time, while it was being made into the film, which he actually, which he quite <coughs> often does with his pre, his novels and things, goes back and reworks, and he he's been thinking about. A, a, sequel and things. So he was rewriting it. So quite separate from the film. So, he, so we, at the beginning of that we've got his extended new version of the novella which is actually so there's three different works in here and they're all quite different. And that I think is one of the exciting things about, um, about this whole thing is that, that you can have an idea and people can take it in different directions. And, and Woody was wonderfully open to the fact that, that the film was taking it in a slightly different direction he was taking and he and it's wonderful when when writers can can embrace that um, process I mean, some feel threatened or, or, or don't want anything changed but witty um, was was very open to it and so this book is really a celebration of that creativity and how it can go in different directions and and that's and it's really fascinating <coughs> seeing what what um, different people, or even himself, where he takes it in different, just extending little bits, and it's and so yeah, so they are three different works. Mm -hmm. Some of that was inspired <clears throat> as well by the fact that um, Dana had made a number of films in Mexico, and uh, in particular, two of them had really fabulous books produced around the the production. Now you know it's a much bigger market, but the quality of those books with the um, visual material and the screenplay and all that was really quite something and so we felt that here was an opportunity to do something that was similar and I and you know the the combination of these three tellings of the story and the story of the way it was adapted for screen and the visual material I think you know it makes it it, it makes it a really valuable uh, piece of, 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 of publishing and we expect that it will be used quite a lot in schools. And when the DVD comes out, we'll be, you know, talking with Random about, and, and the DVD distributor, about putting these two things together. And even in an electronic age, you won't be able to get that 
in an electronic? Oh, I just, I we have released oh, those needles. So. <laughs> what do I know? We, oh, have, we had to send flight down a bit because the files, that thing with the, that's the thing with e-books, is that yeah. they, can be, they can only be so big. But, so we did have to reduce some, some of the, the, the fancy um, enhancement there, but, um, but it has got the pictures in it. And, yeah, and so, okay. Um, and it's, uh, it's been on the bestseller list since it was first published. So, so there's definitely interest in which is exciting for all of us. But, but in that, which is an innovative sort of free, free for one format, it's, it's not like the revised version of Witty's book is selling as White Lies on it, as its stand, standalone novel. Do you know what I mean? Is it only within the context of what you've got yeah. there? So, yeah, because yeah. it was a novella, so it's a short... So we were able to do that because it was that short enough. Yeah. That and the original was not a standalone piece. It was, it was uh, part of Ask the Post of this house, yeah. a, a collection of stories, right. including the novella. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the books that you chose to share, from my point of view, there seems to be a prominence of historical novels. Yeah. Um, and that's interesting. Do you think that's a reflection of your personal choices or what's actually being written by authors or what the New Zealand marketplace likes in terms of novels? There's been a, quite a, a lot of... Um, well, since since I first published Jenny Patrick, Stanston Rose, um, how many years ago? Yeah, probably about ten years ago now, um, which was huge bestseller and it's still selling. Um, that's been option. It, it was optioned, but it fell over in the end. Um, we had several people interested in it, but it, it, it and it was optioned for quite a while, and it was getting somewhere. But it's. I thought the film commission had just given some money for. Which project? Dennis and Rose. No, not really. Oh. No, it, 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 it's many, many years ago. Many years well, ago, it was. Okay. But, um, but that um, that suddenly it, it came at the right time. I think that suddenly New Zealanders. Up till then, stuff from overseas was all interesting, history from overseas was interesting, but we weren't interested in our own stories. And then suddenly, Michael King's History of New Zealand things, people were suddenly starting to look around at our own stories, and it, it was this huge flowering of interest. And as a result, the readership for historical New Zealand fiction um, burgeoned. And so, so there is a huge, there is a demand. It's... Um, so we publish, as a result, there's quite a lot, and, and writers are responding to that. Um, it's not guaranteed. It's not... Um, it's interestingly, uh, we've experimented, and it's, it's actually not the sort of stuff that gets published as historical fiction overseas, which tends to be more down market. It is actually more literary here, um, and, uh, and it does sell, and there is interest. So I know it's expensive, but that's what readers are actually interested in. So that may trans transplant into to film too, uh. Was your question specifically for the random catalogue? Well, apart from Puria, which seemed to have, I mean, because it was open by John, it, it did seem across the board from all that it was just that there was a majority of novels shown for us to look at from your point of view with historical, and I was just wondering whether there was a sort of across the board sort of feeling that that's what's getting bought or. Fergus. Well, I, it's what's being written at the moment. Um, I'm very closely involved in the International Institute of Modern Letters, so you get 20 writers a year go through the MA programme. And there's been a real wave of writers in their 20s and 30s um, writing historical fiction, um, not just Ellie Catton, but Lawrence Patchett and Amy Head. have recently done books set specifically in the West Coast in the Gold Rush era, um, and I'm really curious as to why that is. Um, it, it is to some extent an international phenomenon. If I go to book fairs or I go to literary festivals in Canada or Australia, I can see the same things with their, you know, excellent li young literary writers. Um, so there is a taste there. Um, and those books don't necessarily sell better than the other um, literary fiction that we do. The, the, the Dennis and Rose certainly does, but, but over our list, I, I'm not noticing that the historical factor particularly appeals to audiences more, but it appeals to some of the best and brightest young writers at the moment. And perhaps that's a sign for where you know, your audience's um, tastes are going to develop into the future. But if you think about writers like Chad Taylor or Jeff Cochran, I mean, those are contemporary kind of... Well, I, mean, yeah. I would say that the yeah. 90s... Mm. 
Yeah, but you don't have to set it in the 70s. Yeah, but that's true. I'm not sure about that. I think the 1970s is now a historical period, which yeah. is fascinating <laughs> in its own way. Um, that's the point of view, I guess, from our point of view. Yeah, the 70s yeah. could be updated to yeah. a contemporary version much more easily than something set in the 1800s could be reimagined re re as a contemporary story. Yeah. And I think, I mean, I think that the, the, the publishers who come today have been very generous with the, with the material they've got. But you, you've got to, if you're in this business, you've got to be looking through their lists and reading the material. Because quite often you read something that might have been, you know, might be very old. You know, I, 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 I'm intrigued myself. I, I'm intrigued by a story that Anthony Trollope wrote when he visited New Zealand in 1860 or 1870. And it's set in an ideal society in the 1980s. And he predicts a time when people can, the news from London is available to people in an earpiece that's um, only seven minutes behind the time that they hear it in London. And, and that people are moving around on four wheel vehicles. And, um, and in this book, people have decided that they've gone to live on this island, which is either Great Barrier or possibly Waiheke. Um, and um, uh, that the biggest problem that we face is an ageing population and therefore a whole group of people in their 30s and 40s go and live on this place with the express view that at 64 you go into this wonderful old folks home and at 65 you go out the back end of the old folks home. <laughs> and as it's set, you know, it's, it, it's the Prime Minister, best friend, is just about to turn 65. And, you know, I mean, you find, you, you, you dig around and you find books like that. I mean, I don't know if it'll ever get made, but it intrigued me. But there you go. They just keep looking, you know. Anything else? What are some of the prices that you're looking for? We tend to, uh, because, as I said, we'd like to agree the, the agreement with the option, and it... At that stage, nobody really knows how much funding is going to be found or whatever. So we tend to do a percentage of the budget, um, and then if it's a big, ends up being big, there's more money. If it ends up being small, then it's less. So we tend to work. work I mean, I think most um, m most film rights agreements have a you know a, ce a ceiling and a floor, yeah. percentage yeah. and a ceiling and a floor. Um, I mean, we try and be as realistic as as possible. Um, and, you know, in terms of options, I mean, my experience of option agreements is that um, there's not, there doesn't seem to be a lot of money available at for the options, moment yeah. for options. So the options are quite, from my view, quite cheap. I think another important thing for you to understand is the publishers take a very, very low percentage of all of this. So it is, you know, we, we're really, when we work with an author, we, my view is we're, you know, we're working in their interests, we're custodians of their rights, really, and, and we're working on their behalf. So it's not publishers seeking to make a lot of money out of this, it's actually us just representing our authors in the best way possible. Um, the, the money side has got, gone down, I have to say. I, I don't know what you that saying, but the yeah. offers have been much lower in the last I think five the years. Thing about an option is that, you know, what we're really trying to see is what's going to, what's, what can we do to help it become a film? And I think it's sort of working through that process. So I don't think you go into an option thinking we'll get as much money as we can at this stage. I think that, um, uh, you know, as Deborah says, the, the percentage of the budget is, is um, what is of interest rather than the money that you get for the option. Uh, because, and that's why the publishers need to ask some questions about the bona fides of the... Of, of the applicant because, um, you know, if it's a 5000 or $10,000, dollars if it's tied up for a period of time and nothing happens, then that hasn't helped. And yet, you know, for the books that were on that bestseller, um, the best movie list, we know that Whale well, Rider, and we know around the world the numbers of, of, of copies that it shifted, and that we know the copies of, of, of Once for Warriors, and, you know, all of those books suddenly have a life when there's a film, so you know there's a the the percentage of the budget can be quite can be quite good, um, but um, it's really the the book sales that you that you're going to regenerate. And it may have a new cover and it may have a new title, it might be something else, but 
but that's really what you're, what you're looking for. Do many authors cross over and become screenwriters? I don't think so. <laughs> I think they're very different arts, and my advice to writers is, to you know, the, the authors, is that they're better off um, having sort of proper meetings with the, the screen the filmmakers and trusting their vision because they have to be transformed in the adaptation process and leaving them to it. Um, I've had a couple of cases of writers who have become involved in the adaptation of their own work which has gone on for years and um, has not made it to production um, but the real damage isn't that. The real damage is the amount of writing time that's been wasted in trying to sort of revisit something that they should be passed. But some do. Some, some have Taken screen they've taken screenwriting courses and things so that they can actually adapt their, their own. Um, so it varies, but on the, on the whole, I tend to advise authors to say, look, hand over the rights, let them do what they want to do with it, because you, know, you can't control their vision for it. Um, you have to let go. Take the money and run, I say. <laughs> actually, the other... Um example we have had is some writers taking up screenwriting to earn money uh, because you know it's so hard to earn money from being an author only and so we have got it's hard to get them back though to <laughs> get them back to writing a novel when they're actually making money writing for film or for television. Have there ever been situations where an author has taken the money and run and, and relinquished rights and then the film has gone on to be a massive success and probably this is more than here, and then the author feels a bit like, that's my, that's my story, that's my IP, and it's suddenly serving everybody else's interests more? Well, normally the author would be getting a share of, of that success, so they're quite comfortable about the fact that it's <laughs> been a worldwide hit. I mean, I think they, all of these people and the agents would have negotiated not just a share, not just a, 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 a sum based on the, on the budget, but a, a share of the back end. Net right? profits. Yeah. Yeah. But I've, with my experience, that's quite rare, actually. It's, yeah. <laughs> really? It's, well, yeah. it can be, <laughs> can be argued over that. Okay. We ask, we do, we do argue for it. So now you guys know when you're negotiating with Barney that he gives up the yeah. Well, I was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the fact is, we, we, do we always do it? We always do it. Yeah. Because we, we never don't do it. So we've obviously yeah. got differing. Well, so we would I never was, not ask for a share all, of no, profits. No, we always do ask for it. I was, I but was, it's got to make a profit. It's <laughs> well, the challenge. Yeah. Well, in, in New Zealand film, um, you know, rarely covers its production budget. On the other hand, there is a corridor which is available to the producer. We, we actually feel very strongly about this, that the material that you are based your screenplay on that you know, a whole lot of the work has been done in that, and the the creator of that deserves some of that um, some of that revenue. And if you know, if you were sitting down with somebody to create a fresh story with fresh characters, you would re reward them appropriately. And regardless of whether you go to somebody to do the adaptation, it is based on a work that that exists. And the fact that you go into the market with um, uh, you know, a warriors or a or a whale rider, and and that your audience knows exactly what it is without you having to uh, say, well, it's a film about domestic mm -hmm. violence in South Auckland. I know that doesn't sound very good, but really you'll go, you'll like it. People already know that when you get there. So you know, the author, the book really deserves it. I mean, you'll find maybe some things that are out of copyright. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> but, you know, Anthony Trollope. But <laughs> you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> This year we're doing eight fiction titles, which is our most ever. Usually it's running about um, four or five a year. But we're finding that the um, supply of great new writers is increasing just at the point where um, the market is becoming more difficult than it's ever been. And um, you know, publishers are faced with two options in times like this. You can either be really tough with your publishing decisions and publish fewer books and make sure that they're the big ones, or you can um, use new technology and you know, and publish smart and try and provide the same range of um, options to readers and writers as there has been in the past and because of our special role as a university press and our association with the Creative Writing School um, we've definitely taken the second so we've increased our fiction publishing over the last couple of years and looking ahead I can't see any way that that could decrease again without considerable pain. Deborah? Um, 
we will publish this year probably about 60 titles, and that's across children's from picture books <clears throat> uh, through to fiction and non-fiction. Uh, by far and away, the largest share of our list is non-fiction. Um, we've had a very light year of fiction this year. Next year will be much heavier. Um, it's Sometimes it's difficult to turn the tap on and off, really. I mean, you're sort of um, at the behest of authors when they produce a work, and if it's a good work. So this year we've been very light. Next year I think we'll have probably around seven fiction titles, which will be the most we've done for a few years. And Harriet? We published about 80 titles, I think, this year. And, um, give or take, and fiction uh, publish around about 12 per year. Used to be about 20, but we cut it down. Um, well, well, thank you. This, this um, session was in a way inspired by uh, my experience of attending the Melbourne International Film Festival um, 37 South Market, where a, a range of publishers uh, come to uh, in front of a bunch of producers and um, uh, give synopses of all their books. This year there were 90 titles that were on, um, uh, on offer and as a producer, you express the genre that you're interested in, and then you have 20-minute meetings with, with any number of publishers um, who talk about what they've got, and uh, um, in the hope that they, you'll find something that you uh, like and that they'll, they'll be able to play something with you. And uh, I do think that, that um, you know, the, the publishing world holds so much for the, for the visual, um, the screen industry, and that um, you know, it's great to create a relationship. And I would urge you all to watch what these people and the other New Zealand publishers are doing, and to think about this as um, source material, and to uh, treat it with respect. And um, hope you all get something from it. Thank you very much.